Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Good morning to all of you, and Happy New Year. Thank you all so much for being here on this uh, cold and dark and stormy morning. Uh, we have a very special guest, as you know. I just have one brief announcement before I introduce uh, our host. Uh, if you valet parked here at the Hyatt Regency Crystal City, when you go to get your car, simply tell them that I sent you. Uh, just say, I'm with AUSA, and it will be taken care of. All right, and now, without further ado, let me introduce the President of the Association of the United States Army, General Carter Ham. Thanks, Michael, and, and good morning to all on this blustery Washington, D.C. morning. The Chief was commenting upon um, how weak it is that Washington, D.C. gets close to shutting down with a scattering of snow, and, and uh, real Northeasterners don't worry about little stuff like this. It's, uh, it is great to be here. Uh, first, let me, let me give, offer a spe special uh, word of thanks to, to Mantech, our sponsor, uh, for their support of this breakfast. And uh, joining General Milley at the head table is Mantech's Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Kevin Phillips. Kevin, thank you very, very much. You know, the reality is that uh, without, without sponsors like Mantech, without your membership, events like this uh, simply uh, are not possible. Um, uh, uh, lots of dignitaries here this morning. We could spend the rest of the morning kind of going through naming all the dignitaries in the room. In fact, uh, from my perspective, and certainly from all of us at AUSA, you're all dignitaries. Uh, but I'll exercise the prerogative of the podium, uh, perhaps lectern, uh, wherever Michael is, whichever is correct, uh, to, to, to single out just a few. Uh, we're honored this morning to be joined by the Under Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy. A great friend of the Army, the former Acting Secretary of the Army, Bob Spear. General Dick Cody, former Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Providing adult supervision for General Cody is General J.C. Campbell, also former <laughs> Vice Chief of Staff. General Lou Wagner is here someplace. Uh, wherever, where are you, General Wagner? There he is, All right? General Paul Kern is here, all the way from sunny Florida. Thank you for joining us in the snow, General Kern. <laughs> Hardest working man on the Army staff, Lieutenant General Gary Cheek, the director of the Army staff. <laughs> Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly. Who? <laughs> Sergeant Major of the Army, retired, Ken Preston. Back at the head table, Lieutenant General Dan Hokinson, Vice Chief, National Guard Bureau. Dan, thanks for coming. <laughs> Dr. Bruce Jetty, Assistant Secretary of the Army Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology. I think somewhere I saw Mr. Carl Schneider, who's the Deputy Chief Management Officer. He's probably working, the under's got him working hard. Um, the, the, the award winner for longest title goes once again to Ray Horahoe, senior official performing the duties of the acting assistant secretary of the Army, Manpower and Reserve Affairs. <laughs> and Mr. Michael Powers, the acting assistant secretary of the Army, Financial Management. The money guys. I'd like to also acknowledge we've got uh, several congressional staff that have uh, joined us here this, this morning. Uh, Alexis Ross and Drew Warren from the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, Nathan uh, Berger Best, Deputy Chief of Staff for Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. From the Senate Armed Services Committee, Jim Hickey, Allison Lazarus, and Matt Lampert, and Rick Nuccio from the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. You and all the other staffers, welcome here this morning. And finally, a, a, a very special welcome to our allies and, and partners from other nations. As Secretary Mattis spoke at Dr. Esper's swearing-in ceremony just uh, a week or so ago, a nation, an army with allies and friends is always 
stronger than those without, and we're honored that you joined us here this morning. Thank you. Before I, before I introduce our, our guest speaker and the guy you all came to hear this morning, just a couple of reminders of, of upcoming events. On the 8th of February, 8th of February, big deal at the AUSA headquarters, uh, Sergeant Major of the Army Dan Daly will speak that evening. All are welcome to that for, uh, for an exciting evening, and, and, and as he always does, the Sergeant Major of the Army will tell us what the Chief is about to tell us and what he really meant. So, so thanks, Sergeant Major. Uh, the first of our uh, 2018 Hot Topics series uh, will be on the 28th of February uh, for Army Air and Missile Defense, again at the AUSA Conference and Events Center. And then coming up at the end of March, uh, our 2018 Global Force Symposium and Exhibition in, uh, in Huntsville, Alabama. For more information about these events and others, and, uh, or to register for these events, visit our website or see any of the great AUSA staff right outside the room. And lastly, uh, just a shameless reminder on, on membership, if you're not yet a member, today is the day to join over 110,000 like-minded patriots to join or renew your membership with AUSA today. Just for the record, that's about 50,000 more members than we had at this time last year. Thank you for your great support. It's now my great uh, honor and privilege to introduce to you a great soldier, an unselfish leader, a man I'm privileged to call my friend, our chief, the 39th Chief of Staff, General Mark Milley. Thanks, Carter, and I appreciate that. And um, no matter how hard I try, I can't seem to buy a snow day here in D.C. Um, but uh, thanks so much. And, you know, Sergeant Major Daly, I, I would just want to echo what a great Sergeant Major we have. Uh, this is a guy who was over at the house the other day. We were drinking some coffee, and his wife and my wife were there, and he made me feel unbelievably inadequate. Um, this, is a, this is no kidding now. This is, <clears throat> this is a guy who is a certified auto mechanic, a certified plumber. He is an electrician, a carpenter, a woodworker. He sings, he plays an instrument, he does his wife's hair, he's a barber, uh, and about 20 other things. So you talk about, uh, in addition to being a soldier, a father, and a husband. So, uh, Sergeant Major Daly, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate that. And, and as you know, <laughs> and Sergeant Major Daly, of course, represents, uh, you know, 99% of the United States Army, and, and we've got a tremendous... Uh, non-commissioned officer and enlisted force, uh, as I had a second to none anywhere in the world. So uh, thanks for doing what you're doing, and thanks for all who you represent. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, that's here. There's a lot of distinguished visitors, and I uh, particularly want to thank Carter Hamm, who I've served under uh, many, many times. Uh, he is a wonderful person, a wonderful leader, a tremendous officer uh, who's made major contributions to our nation's uh, defense uh, over the years. Uh, and when, uh, when I was down there in J-33, DDRO, JOD, along with John Campbell and many, many others uh, in this room. Uh, Carter had uh, one saying, it was row well and live. So that gives you a sense then for his positive leadership style. Uh, and, and Carter is just wonderful. So thank you so much, General. I appreciate it. Hey, look at, uh, there's too many. There's too many uh, VIPs in here to acknowledge everyone. And every one of you is a a uh, very distinguished and important person, but there are two others uh, that I do want to just mention by name. Uh, you know, Bob Spear is sitting out here, and he stepped up to the plate uh, to be our acting uh, Secretary of the Army at a time uh, that we needed that, uh, and, and uh, I appreciate that. This is a guy who's a career uh, military officer in his own right, uh, and then a career uh, civilian, Department of the Army, Department of Defense civilian, uh, and he did a tremendous job as our acting uh, Secretary before handing it off. Uh, to to uh, the, the current uh, secretary. Uh, so thanks, Secretary Spear, for doing what you've done. And lastly, just mention, you know, when, when Secretary Spear uh, popped smoke and threw his, you know, spray-painted gold boots over the proverbial wire, um, he handed it off to this other guy right over here, Ryan McCarthy. Uh, and I don't know how many of you know uh, Secretary McCarthy very well. I've known him for a, quite a long time. Uh, this is a guy who's a tremendous asset to our Army. Uh, he, is, uh, 
he is taking the ball and he's running with it and he's putting the ball in the end zone. Uh, I would say he's almost as good as Tom Brady, except he's from Chicago, so he's not quite that good. Uh, but he's, he's a highly talented uh, person. He's a guy with tremendous combat skills uh, in his own right, serving in the Ranger Regiment. He's got plenty of time under fire in combat. Uh, he's got great experience in industry, great experience up on the hill, great experience in DOD. And we are really blessed to have uh, Ryan McCarthy as our undersecretary as a team with Secretary Esper. Uh, and I think uh, the combination of Secretary Esper and Ryan McCarthy, Jim McConville as the vice, uh, and many, many others on the Army staff under Gary Cheek's leadership, uh, this is an important year, uh, 2018, for the Army. Uh, this is a, a year of, uh, of some really exciting things that I think we're doing in the Army, and I wanted to uh, share with you a couple of them. Carter did limit me to 10 minutes, which I interpreted to be one hour. So uh, I did want to, however, uh, cover uh, some of those things. And I, we've talked about uh, readiness. Uh, readiness has uh, been our priority. It remains our priority. All you have to do is pick the newspaper up, turn on cable news. Uh, there are plenty of reasons why we need to continue to emphasize readiness as the Army's number one priority. And I don't need to go over all of those headlines, all of those contingencies. Uh, but the world is a very dynamic place. It's a dangerous place. Uh, and it is a place that we, the United States, need trained, ready, capable uh, military forces from all of the services, not just the Army. Uh, and for us, the Army, uh, we have put great emphasis on that uh, in uh, my first two years as chief uh, and, and previous chiefs as well. Uh, and we're going to continue to put great emphasis on it. But that's not good enough. Readiness is not good enough. Uh, you have to also prepare for some unknown future uh, at some unknown date. And that leads us to modernization, which is just a, another word, really, for future readiness. If all you do is focus on the present and then you mortgage the future, uh, then you're going to be in a world of hurt 10, 15 uh, years from now. If you look back today, the 17th uh, of January, if you look back uh, 27 years, uh, at, at this moment, uh, early uh, in the evening or early in the morning at O-Dark 30, uh, a lieutenant colonel named Dick Cody, who's sitting at the front table, uh, led an Apache A-64 assault uh, across the berm uh, against Saddam Hussein's entrenched forces uh, in Kuwait. Uh, and that assault opened up the door uh, for air forces uh, to go in and pound uh, Saddam and, and do all the pre-assault fires and the preparatory activity for the 100-hour ground war. Uh, that didn't happen by accident. When Dick Cody went across that berm, that wasn't a bunch of pixie dust and magic dust sprinkled and said, okay, let's do it. And it wasn't because Saddam didn't have effective air defenses up. It wasn't because his army was weak and decrepit or any of that. Uh, he was able to do that because of years of training and because there were people in the 70s who said, I want a new attack helicopter. I want to replace the Cobra. I want to uh, get going here with A-64s, and I want to get some really high-speed equipment in the hands of our Army, and I want to modernize the Army. And, of course, everyone in this room is familiar with that being uh, the Big Five. Uh, and that, in combination with a lot of leader development, uh, a lot of doctrinal uh, innovation, a lot of organizational changes, and then repetitive over and over and over again uh, training at the National Training Center, the Joint Readiness Training Center, repeated over and over again, that is what allowed Dick Cody to fly across that berm and successfully punch a hole for the Air Force to come through and then the follow-on ground forces and to defeat a significant-sized army uh, in the deserts of Kuwait. It was an accident. It was a vision of modernization, and it was readiness. In combination, those two things uh, led to success on the battlefield. We find ourselves today, uh, in my mind, at a, a bit of a transition period in history. And you've heard me talk about it several times before, about a change in the character of war. We are in that change, literally in that fundamental change in the character of war right this minute. Uh, and we are uh, somewhere, my guess, is sort of in the middle of maybe a 10, 20, 30 year historical process. Uh, it, the nature of war is never going to change, but the character of war is changing before our eyes uh, with the introduction of a lot of technologies, with a lot of societal 
uh, changes with urbanization and a whole wide variety of other factors. If we, the United States Army, if we, the United States military, uh, do not recognize the need for change, and if we do not adapt and pivot uh, to that change, uh, then, in my mind, uh, that will be a grave strategic mistake. So while we focus on readiness, and we must do that with today's equipment, today's soldiers, today's doctrine, and really train hard, repetitive, because you just don't know. You don't know when the nation will call. But at the same time you do that, you must focus on future readiness and modernization and investments, and that's what we intend to do. So how do we, you know, what's the kind of the, the logic trail uh, behind that? Um, it's not complicated. So if you ask yourself, uh, what does an army do? Well, armies fight wars, and what do you want them to do? You want them to win. And broadly speaking, there's two typologies of war. Broadly speaking, there's lots of different types of wars. Uh, the war in the Pacific was different than the war in Europe. The war in the Central Pacific was different than the South Pacific. The war from Normandy to the, to, the, to, the, to the Rhine was one type of war. The war from the Rhine into Germany was a different type of war. So there's different types of war. But broadly speaking, there's two big kind of categories of, of war, I would argue. Uh, one is what the Marines call small wars. You've heard it termed counterinsurgency, counterterrorism perhaps. Uh, irregular warfare. So you've got that typology of war. That is the typology of war that we have been fighting for 16 consecutive years. Uh, but there's another typology of war, a war against a higher potential uh, capability uh, of a threat, uh, the, what, what many have called the, quote, big war. Now, big wars are, that's debatable. Uh, you know, was Vietnam a big war? Was Korean War a big war? Was uh, uh, the Civil War a big war? Was the Spanish-American War a big war? World War I, World War II? Well, you know, the answer would be yes to all of those. <clears throat> but what I'm talking about is the capability to fight against something that many would argue is called a near-peer or peer-type capability um, that is on a highly dynamic, highly lethal uh, battlefield against someone who has significant uh, combined arms maneuver capability in all of the domains of war in land, and maritime, and air, and space, and in cyber. And we have to modernize ourselves against that type or the best practices of that type of capability. Uh, and others out there in the world today, call them adversaries, call them competitors, call them whatever name you want to put on it, uh, they are in fact doing that, and we need to pick our game up and pick our pace up, especially uh, in the United States, in the United States Army. And to do that, uh, again, armies fight wars. Uh, I think we have great skills uh, to fight, win, and, and, and handle the counterinsurgency, counterterrorism. Uh, but we've got areas that we need significant improvement in the other typology of war. And that's what we've been doing. And for the, specifically for the United States Army, within the context of a war, what is expected uh, of the U.S. Army? Our specified task, our job for the nation, is to man, train, equip, and prepare an army uh, to conduct sustained land campaigns. We are one of the few, arguably the only, army remaining in the world that is capable in and of itself of conducting sustained land campaigns uh, within the context of a joint force. We must sustain, improve, and continue to accentuate that capability. So how do you do uh, sustained land campaigns as our contribution to winning a war? Again, not complicated. Uh, I believe that you focus on the fundamentals. You focus uh, on hitting the sled over and over and over again. Uh, you win games by blocking and tackling at the line of scrimmage. You don't win it by Hail Mary passes. Uh, you win by having good goaltenders, good fielding, good batting, uh, not to overdo the sports analogy, but you win by focusing on the fundamentals and getting to a level of excellence in the fundamentals that is without peer. So what are the fundamentals? Again, not complicated. Uh, it is nothing more uh, than shoot, move, communicate, protect, and sustain all about uh, wrap for the Army, all about wrapping around the soldier. So that leads me then to the modernization priorities that we've already announced publicly, and really these are 
not programs per se, they are bins of programs. Uh, they are bins in which we are grouping things. So in shoot, uh, what we've identified uh, is long range precision fires. Uh, our Army, historically and today, uh, and our military uh, emphasizes, accentuates, and uses precision fires to great extent. Uh, we, the Army, have a major part in that. We already have good long range fires, relatively long range. But I'm not talking about the ranges that currently exist uh, today. I'm talking about a 10x capability uh, for ground forces to really reach out and touch, not with missiles, but with bullets. Uh, the technology is there, the engineering is there, the capability is there. It's not physically here right this minute, but we're working very, very hard under the great leadership of Secretary McCarthy and the Vice General McConville to get long range precision fires. That's the number one priority that we want. Uh, so shoot. And then in move, how do armies move? They move on their feet. If you're in the light infantry, uh, you move by vehicle, either wheeled or track, or you move by air, primarily rotary wing. But also you move uh, strategically by either sea or airlift. So we've got to work on move. So the two areas of priority that we said there was, again, to develop the next generation vehicle, combat vehicle, both track and wheel, and future vertical lift. So one, long range fires, two, next generation combat vehicle, three, future vertical lift. And that will enable us uh, to conduct combined arms maneuver. Those vehicles, and I, people say, oh, FCS, command, no, 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 different animal. Again, we're talking about 10x capabilities that don't physically exist in the real world right this minute, but they will. And we're doing a lot of engineering, R&D, S&T, to make them exist. And we're working closely with industry uh, to do that. <clears throat> we're talking about vehicles that are both manned and unmanned. Every vehicle's got to have the capability to be robotic, as an example. Uh, so we're looking at alternative fuels, different types of power packs, uh, the protection of the vehicle, the materials of the vehicle to make them significantly lighter so you have strategic mobility as well as tactical mobility. Then if you get into uh, the next piece, which is shoot, move, communicate, that's where you get into this really controversial thing about the, quote, network, of which I know I am on a lot of people's uh, you know, not like list. Uh, so because of what I've said and done, uh, what the Army's done about the network over the last year, look at the, the reality is uh, the command control communication systems that we have are very, very capable, uh, and they're good to deal with a certain type of war and a certain type of environment. But it was my assessment, and it remains my assessment, that uh, there is a massive amount of improvement that is radically and, and quickly needed in order to have a communication, command control communication system that is effective against a competitor that has high-end capabilities uh, in electronic warfare, cyber, and so on. Then you also have to have a, a capability of the network that can move and, and very quickly displace, otherwise uh, you'll be dead in the water. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done in network, but uh, long-range precision fires, uh, next-generation combat vehicle, future vertical lift, network. And none of that's going to matter if you're dead. So you have to protect the force. And one of the areas that we want to significantly improve our protection capabilities is in ballistic missile defense and close range air defense for our tactical units. Uh, if you look around the world, again, not rocket science, you can figure out that this is a needed increase. We already have capability, but we need to increase uh, that capability of both in capacity uh, and in the technological skills in order to protect our force. And then lastly, in the category of sustain wrapped around the soldier, we've labeled it uh, a category called soldier lethality. Uh, the Army and the Marine Corps are people organizations. Uh, the Navy is a platform-centric organization built around ships, although they place a lot of emphasis as well on their sailors. Uh, the Air Force is clearly platform-centric on airframes, although, again, they place a lot of emphasis on their airmen and their pilots and so on. Uh, but the Army and the Marines are very much a labor-intensive force, and we owe our soldiers 
the absolute best equipment, uh, training, leader development that is humanly possible uh, that the largest and most competent economy in the world can produce. There should be no reason not to do that. From head to toe, the best helmet, the best sappy plates, the best goggles, the best communications equipment, the best pistols, the best rifles, best machine guns, the best everything, all the way down to the boot. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. If it goes on or touches an American soldier, they should have the best, bar none. And, and the American people, I believe, uh, would fully support that. For the most part, right now, they do. But we're, again, we're talking into the future. So we want equipment that can extend and sustain the soldier uh, over time and incredible intensity of endurance and hardship in a very austere environment. So again, I've, you've heard me say before, you're not gonna have Chew Hutch, you're not gonna have Pete Hutch, you're not gonna have this or that or the other thing. This environment, this future war uh, environment, this operational environment that we're talking about is going to be extremely demanding uh, on the individual soldier. Uh, so we want to make sure uh, that they are capable of handling that. So we are doing a lot of work on uh, developing uh, things like exoskeletons, uh, the cognitive uh, abilities of the mind to uh, train uh, soldiers to deal in very complex environments. Uh, we're working on a whole wide variety of um, synthetic training where we can take leaders uh, and soldiers and run them through hitting the sled over and over and over again, changing the conditions and raising the level of difficulty. And there's about 20 other specific programs that are under, buried underneath that bin. So those are the priority areas that the U.S. Army uh, is shifting to uh, to modernize its force uh, and prepare ourselves uh, for a future environment uh, in order to stay well ahead of the end. We do not want a level playing field. We do not want uh, an even fight, a fair fight against our enemies. We want to be so dominant, so good, uh, so capable uh, that our enemies would never dare attack the United States and that our enemies know for sure if they did, they would lose. So the act of readiness today and preparing for tomorrow, uh, the, the actual act of modernization and the act of readiness actually deters war. And that is ultimately what you want because that's much cheaper than fighting one. Uh, and if you're not modernized, you might end up fighting one and losing one. So we don't want that. We want an army uh, that is capable today, right now, to deter any of our potential enemies. And if deterrence fails uh, and, the, and the American people decide they're gonna commit the United States Army, then we wanna go in there and win, win fast and hard and get in there and put an end to the thing. That's today's readiness. That's what we're trying to do. For tomorrow, it's the exact same thing, except the conditions are different. The operational environment will be different, and the type of equipment, the technologies, the training, the doctrine will be different. And that's the point of the modernization. So those are the six areas of uh, priority. I know we have a lot of industry here. We have congressional staffers here. Those are the areas, and this is the year in which Secretary McCarthy, uh, Secretary Esper, uh, General McConville and many others are driving those six priorities absolutely ruthlessly and I think we're going to make some really really great uh, success in this year and I'm really excited about it. So I don't know if that was 10 minutes Carter but that was pretty close by my watch and I'll be happy to open it up. I think uh, you wanted to do some question and answer uh, so I'll be happy to take whatever questions are out there from anyone. Jim Hickey good to see you. How are you doing? Right where? Right here. Yes, sir. Oh, Sydney, how are you? I, I'm still here. Sydney's a good man. He went to Harvard. He, he wanted to go to Princeton. He couldn't get in, so we're going to send him to Harvard. <laughs> All right. You got a good haircut, Sydney, though. I do like that. <laughs> you have a Cambridge haircut. Excellent. I don't know if you know it. Sydney's dad was one of the monuments men in World War II. Uh, his, his father was a professor in art history, and he was one of those guys going through Europe doing that kind of stuff. Pretty cool. Okay, Sydney, fire away. Well, I was just trying to buy myself some time. Sure. Well, let me ask, you said, you know, people may call it the specter of FCS. This is not like FCS. And then I hear you say, you know, repeatedly, 10X. Right. Now, one of the things, you know, to be skeptical, one of the things that drove FCS 
to the extremes where it fell apart yeah. was desire for you know an exponential improvement. If you look at right. the big five, I don't think people would say that you know an Apache is worth ten Cobras or an Abrams. I would actually. Okay, but anyway. But and I would say that an M1 tank was worth ten M68s or ten M4 Shermans or ten M48s. I mean those systems were radical advancements over that which previously existed. Mm -hmm. But anyway, 10x out of 10x is a term as opposed to an exact measurement. But anyway, go ahead, continue. But how do you Cambridge. find the, the sweet spot between, you know, achievable but yeah. dramatic improvements and right. that bridge too far where well, what we, no, you, don't I hear anything, you never get anything? Yeah, so what we're trying to say, what I'm trying to say is, look, I'm not interested in a linear progression into the future. Uh, that will end up in defeat on a future battlefield. If we think that if we just draw a straight line into the future and simply make incremental improvements to current systems, then we're blowing smoke up our collective fourth point of contact. And that is a dangerous thing uh, to do. That is not good. So what I'm talking about is a significant, call it 10x, call it leap ahead, all those type of terms, a very significant radical improvement in current capabilities. Uh, that is because we want to uh, be absolutely dominant and we want the enemy to know we are dominant. And there are areas, Sydney. there are areas, and I'm not going to go over too much of the specifics, but there are areas in which you can get 10x relative to current capabilities. One of them, for example, is robotics. Robotics is here. It is real. It is in the real world. The Navy and the Air Force are moving out smartly with it, but the environment they're dealing with is different than the ground environment. They're dealing with water and air, which is a different medium and has a different engineering solution to it. The ground is, is much more difficult to do robotic solutions. However, they are overcoming those. So within, call it 10 years, 15 years, ground forces, armies worldwide, are going to have like it or not, robotic vehicles. And that will be a fundamental shift in uh, ground combat capabilities that doesn't exist today. Uh, that's one example. Artificial intelligence is another example. Whether we like it or not, artificial intelligence is coming. Machine learning is coming. Depending on who you talk to, <clears throat> some uh, you know, professors and techno folks out in Silicon Valley, etc. Some will tell you artificial intelligence uh, will never happen in the way that many futurists are talking about. Uh, others will tell you it's at least a century away. Others would tell you, no, they're all wrong. Artificial intelligence is here now. It is real, and it's going to get widespread spread application in civil society and in the commercial world easy money within 10 years. Uh, so I don't know. I am not technically sophisticated enough to make a prediction on when artificial intelligence will happen. All I am certain of from what I've read and researched is artificial intelligence will happen. So go back in time. There were many who would tell you that radio wasn't going to happen or telephone or telegraph wasn't going to happen or computers, and so on and so forth. There is a curve to technological development, and, and I don't know what it's going to be for artificial intelligence. But I am pretty certain, and I'm willing to bet on it uh, with uh, programs and money and so on, that artificial intelligence is going to have a significant role to play in societies worldwide and in the conduct of warfare. Uh, so, platforms, you talked about ground vehicles or helicopters, et cetera. What does that mean then? So, robotics, it's pretty clear. Uh, we've already said that future vehicles, air or ground, are going to have to be dual use so that the commander on the ground can make an evaluation of his mission enemy train and time and troops available, and he can estimate the situation, he can make a determination as to whether he wants this assault to be manned or unmanned. Does he want to attack Hill 101 with robots, or does he want to do it with manned vehicles? And the conditions will determine what, what he decides to do. With artificial intelligence, in terms of decision-making, 
uh, we want capabilities in the network that are taking advantage of significant advances in information technology to include artificial intelligence. I don't know if artificial intelligence is going to mean robots and machines replace humanity. I don't know. There are people out there who say that. I don't know. But I do know that quantum computing and some of the IT technologies that are out there today are so significant and can help you make rapid decision making in complex decentralized environments that if we don't take advantage of that in things like the network, then we'd be fools because others are moving out quickly on that and we don't want to find ourselves behind the curve in 10 or 15 years. So that's the kind of technology, Sydney, that I'm talking about. Uh, 10X is probably uh, an overstatement of a term, I suppose, maybe an overuse of a colloquial term. Uh, but my point is significant radical improvements in current capabilities. If we draw a straight line from the present to the future, uh, we're going to be on the short end of the stick in some kind of future conflict. Sir, we have a question over here. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, General. Jeff Shogel with Task and Purpose. You had uh, mentioned that uh, soldier lethality is one of the Army's priorities. Can you talk about where the process stands in getting soldiers a more lethal rifle? Yes. Again, I, I don't want to overstate the term 10X, but uh, we have a good rifle now. Uh, it, it's a capable rifle, and it's uh, easily the match of rifles anywhere around the world. <clears throat> but we have the capability, or we have the possibility, of developing a small arm uh, for infantry forces and cavalry for and others, you know, individual small arm, a rifle. Uh, that is, again, go back to Sydney's term, or my term to Sydney, is a 10x capability. Uh, and the uh, hinge here is the, the, the weapons operating system and the type of ammunition you use. There has been some research and testing uh, done down at Benning and with industry partners that indicates that we could, it's possible, have a rifle in the hands of American soldiers uh, or Marines in the not too distant future, I don't want to put a time on it, that can reach out at much greater ranges than currently exist, which much greater impact or lethality uh, and with much greater accuracy. Um, I don't want to go into too many of the details on it, uh, but it has to do with the type of ammunition, the chamber pressure uh, of, the, uh, of the rifle, and the optics that are being used uh, on the rifle. Uh, it's an excellent system. Uh, they've done some proof of principles on it. Uh, it is real. It is not fantasy. Uh, and industry is moving out quickly. And we expect that with appropriate funding, uh, we should be able to have this particular weapon in the not too distant future. Uh, and I won't define what not too distant future is. Sir? Yes, sir. Hi, General Milley, Megan Myers, Army Times. So in preparing for this big war, what is the manpower requirement for that? And what does the training and deployment cycle look like for something like that? Well, I mean, it, the, the manning, do you say manning cycle or the size of the Army? The size of the Army, man. Yeah, yeah. so uh, given that I'm on the eve of posture hearings and there's budgets and something's going to happen Friday, but we don't know what, um, I'll stay away from size per se. Size is a relative, size of armies, navies, air forces. Are relative. I get asked that question all the time, what size the Army? My immediate answer is, what do you want the Army to do? So it all depends. Um, and, and it's not a cop-out, but that's true. It depends on what you want the Army to do. Um, the national security strategy is out. Uh, I think you're going to see the national defense strategy, General Mattis' strategy, come out shortly. Uh, I think I heard maybe next week or something like that. So we'll get that out there next week. And I don't want to preempt that. But it's within that document that you get the tasks to the Army, Navy, Air Force, the Joint Force, right? And then from that, we do our analysis as to, okay, you want us to do all these tasks. Here's the size of the Army that you need. Um, so I'm going to, Megan, I'm going to dodge is the wrong word, but uh, I, I don't want to answer because the tasks aren't public yet. 
I know what they are, but they're not public yet. And I think it would be inappropriate of me at this point uh, to get out in front of the NDS or get out in front of some hearings that are coming up on the size of the force. Uh, we're moving in the right direction. Let me put it that way. Uh, we had the Army coming down for many, many years. Uh, and with the, uh, with the great support of Congress and the, and the administration uh, for Army end strength, it's turned the corner and we're on, uh, on the climb. It's a gradual climb. It's not massive, major, huge numbers every single year, but it's a steady climb in growth. That's important. We're not talking about increasing the size of the formations or the force structure. We're talking about end strength in order to ensure that all of the units and the f current force structure that does exist to ensure that they are at full operational capability plus. In other words, that they have not only, you know, 100% fill of their people, they've got a little bit extra there to take care of the, to the troops in a given formation that are sick or hurt temporarily. Uh, so end strength matters, but what we want to do is make sure that the current force structure uh, is manned at, at its uh, full complement. Uh, and we've turned the corner, and that's a good thing. With respect to how do you do, like, readiness cycles and that sort of thing, uh, what we've said and what we intend to do and what we are trying to do, uh, we shifted uh, from R4 Gen, uh, the Army Force Generation cycle, which was important, and it was a good system to sustain uh, a, the current war, the, the, the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, in or, because that was relatively predictable. You sort of knew when you were going to go. And that was the focus. So that R4 Gen was a good model for that. But we're entering, we are in a world that is less predictable than that. Uh, and we can't manage the Army by patch chart and guarantee that you are going to get six or 12 months notice and you're going to go to Iraq or Afghanistan. It's a different animal. So what we've instituted is the uh, sustain uh, readiness model. Uh, it's much more demanding, by the way, on the force. Uh, but what we need to do, and because you're hedging bets for unknown contingencies at an unknown time in the future in an unknown place against an unknown enemy. When, you do, when you're in a situation like that, what you have to do is make sure that a certain percentage of your force, and again, it's best judgment, best guess, is in a state of readiness that is capable to deploy uh, anywhere against a high-end near-peer threat that presents a significant capability. To do that, what we've said is we want 66% of the ground force at the highest levels of combat readiness at a moment in time. And then what that does is provide the president uh, and the nation options. Uh, and, and that's our mark on the wall. That's what we shoot for. Uh, and that's what this current system is shooting for. And we're building towards that level of readiness. And that's hard to get to that level of readiness, but that's what we're building towards. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hi, General. Ashley Roki with Shepherd Media. Um, as you're putting together the final touches on the budget and the fit up are coming up, could you give us a little peek of, or even an update of what's going on as you're looking at um, balancing, um, developing the next um, ground combat vehicle with upgrading the Abrams tank? Yeah, so. It, this kind of goes back a little bit to what Sydney was asking about uh, on the next generation combat vehicle. So separate upgrades to Abrams tank from next generation combat vehicle. They're two different things. Uh, when I say that you know these are the six priorities, that doesn't mean that you're not going to fund other things. You're going to have to fund other things. Uh, Cooks White. I'll use Cooks Whites as an example, right? Cooks Whites does not fall neatly into one of those six priorities, but we're going to buy Cooks Whites. So you have to, right, because Cooks have to have their whites. So uh, we're going to continue to upgrade the Abrams tank because you have to. You want to make sure the guts of that tank, and the tank today is different than the one uh, that came into being when I was a second lieutenant. Uh, the guts of it are, the optics, the, the fire control mechanisms, uh, the engine, the power pack, those are all different. However, that tank the M1, is essentially at the max extended range of its life cycle. Uh, that tank came online when I was a second lieutenant 40 years ago. Uh, think about that. So that would be, the analogy would be, when I came in the Army as a second lieutenant, I would be training on an M4 Sherman from World War II. 
because there were 40 years between World War II and the time I came in the Army, more or less, right? So imagine the second Lieutenant Milley coming in the Army in 1980, and I'm training on an M4 Sherman. That wouldn't pass anyone's common sense test. That's what second lieutenants are doing today. They're coming in the Army and training on an M1 tank that is 40 plus years old, and it's built off of the essentials are built off of technologies that existed. Having said that, we've run it through a whole series of incremental changes uh, over time, and those incremental changes have been very good, and that tank is an excellent first-rate tank. Uh, there are others out there who say, well, you know, this versus that. Hey, look at the M1 tank is fine for now, for right this minute. But we should at the same time not think the M1 tank or the Bradley or any of these other vehicles, the Apache and the, are going to be okay 10, 15, 20 years from now. Because I'm, I am absolutely certain there are technologies that are happening in the world today that are and will make these systems uh, obsolete and out of date and they will lose in, in engagements. So for the M1 tank, yes, we will make some more incremental upgrades for the present, for the now. But for the next generation combat vehicle, we are looking at, again, robotics, materials, fire control systems, the type of weapon. Uh, for, you know, for example, one thing that's changing the character of war is urbanization. Urbanization has been going on, uh, you know, for a long time, I guess, ever since mankind figured out how to grow plants and, and went into villages and so on. And then at some point in time, people started collecting themselves into larger urban areas, right? So the curve throughout history goes like that, and people have been gathering in villages for a long time. But now the curve is exponential, and it has been really for probably 25, 30, 40 years. But it is absolutely exponential. So today there's 6 billion people in the world. By mid-century, there's going to be somewhere estimated around 8 billion. Of those 8 billion, roughly speaking, about 90 plus percent are going to live in highly dense urban areas. If war is about politics and politics is all about people and the distribution of goods and resources throughout a society, then wars are going to be fought, whether we like it or not. They're going to be fought in dense urban areas. And what we've seen in Mosul and Raqqa and Fallujah are previews, movie trailers, to highly complex urban battles sometime in the future, just like the Boer War, the Russian-Japanese War, the American Civil War, were movie trailers and previews to World War I. So those battles that you've seen under, undertaken in various urban areas, those are previews. Wars of the future, in my mind, will likely be fought in urban areas. What does, so what does that mean relative to your tank? The United States Army, since, I don't know, 1775 when we were born on the 14th of June, right? From then until now, we've been optimized to fight in rural terrain, in northern temperate zones, in gently rolling hills, North America, Northern Europe, and arguably in the deserts of the Middle East in relatively open order terrain. The Army's been optimized to do that. And we have been sub-optimized to fight in jungles, although we have fought in jungles. We have been sub-optimized to fight in mountains, although we have fought in mountains. And we've been sub-optimized to fight in urban areas, although we have fought in urban areas. In the future, it is my belief that we are going to need to optimize the Army to fight in urban areas and suboptimize the rural, gently rolling hills of Northern Europe, because there are no more gently rolling hills of Northern Europe. Northern Europe is one big megatropolis. Uh, if you look at Korea, Korea, you know, Seoul, megacity, and many, many other places. So what does that mean back to your tank and why the M1 is, is going to have to be replaced and the Bradley as well? Just look at something like the gun elevation. The gun elevation on an M1 tank goes like that, which is good. That's not bad. But in an urban area, it's going to have to go like that. And, and that's, that's fundamental. That's a big difference. So there's all kinds of things like that that we're working with uh, industry 
uh, on the next generation combat vehicle that are going to have to make requirements to be in urban areas, robotic, maximize the use of things like artificial intelligence and man-machine interfacing and machine learning, uh, the elevation of guns. There's all kinds of work being done in kinetics, uh, power plants, alternative fuels, uh, and the protection of the vehicle and the weights of the materials for the vehicle. So when I say we're going to continue to invest in the M1 for a period of time, we have no choice. But the, what I'm talking about, next generation combat vehicle, that's a weapon system that is going to come online at some point in the future once we figure out some of the engineering problems to meet these requirements. Does that help answer your question? Um, I think we, we, the Army, I think we've submitted a, a balanced budget uh, to meet our demands and requirements. We have uh, put additional monies into modernization, uh, but we are still maintaining uh, the priority of readiness. So I think it's balanced. I think it's a good budget, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll wait and see what happens Friday. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, good morning, sir. My name is Captain Stephanie Melton. I'm currently a student at CGSC Fort Belvoir, but I'm assigned to the Security Force Assistance course uh, down at JRTC. My question is, how is the determination made to stand up the SFABs, and do you foresee the combat advisor becoming a functional area? Um, okay, so let's talk SFAB for a second. Not the color of the beret, but something else. So, <laughs> so let me... Uh, why, why do we need uh, a security force assistance brigade? And the, and the doctrine, it's called, uh, in years gone by, it's foreign internal defense. And, uh, but today's doctrine, it's called security force assistance. So what are we talking about, really? We're talking about uh, training, advising, assisting, enabling, accompanying indigenous forces in the conduct of Combat operations, counterinsurgency operations, counterterrorist operations, those sorts of things. These are tasks and functions that the United States Army has been doing really for about a century or more, I guess. Um, and for sure, since the end of World War II. Uh, it was the United States Army that uh, really brought life into the Republic of Korea Army in South Korea. Uh, the Army of Vietnam and armies, many, many armies around the world were, have been trained, advised, and assisted uh, security force assistance by the United States. The need has been there for a long time. And we have met that need, uh, the United States Army has, but we have met it in the last 16 years through ad hoc measures, in my view. And I've been a participant in that. And I think it's been very ad hoc. That's not to say it's bad, it's just been ad hoc. And it's been very disruptive to uh, the training of the force structure that does exist for conventional higher end operation. And the truth is, the United States is going to have to do its both. It's not either or. The United States must maintain capabilities to conduct security force assistance, uh, irregular warfare, uh, space operations, cyber operations, naval operations. Uh, it must be able to conduct air operations. And on the ground, we're, we, the Army, must be able to fight against a near-peer, highly dynamic, lethal environment, operating environment. Uh, at the same time, we must be able to be able to fight uh, in a counterinsurgency environment or a counterterrorist environment. Uh, and we have a wide range of capabilities that we have to do. When it comes to the advisory function, it is my belief, my assertion, my estimation that we were not organized uh, and trained explicitly uh, in the conventional forces to do that specific task. We do have a capability, U.S. Army Special Forces has been trained over, over years uh, for that specific task. But that task is bigger than what the United States Army Special Forces capacity is. And de facto, in the last 16 years, the majority, not all, but the majority of our Special Forces for Train, Advise, Assist has been focused on the indigenous Special Forces. 
So we had an area that we needed improvement. The conventional army did most of, not all of, but most of the advising to the Iraqi and Afghan uh, armies, the regular armies and their police forces. But we were doing it ad hoc. So what I want to do, what I thought was the right thing to do, was to dedicate a capability in order to professionalize it, improve its skills, uh, and, and, and get a better quality product in terms of our advising. So that would be one key output that we want uh, the, is to answer the question why. The other one is I want to stop ripping apart conventional brigade combat teams, which is what we've been doing for 16 years. Uh, we only have X amount of these brigade combat teams, and if we take a whole bunch of them and we shred them, take their leadership apart, and they go through an exercise and we call them advisors, then you're essentially reducing your ground combat capability by whatever amount you commit to that task. I want to stop doing that. I want to make sure that our conventional combined arms maneuver capabilities stay together, train, hit the sled tons of times, and that we also have a advisory capability. Uh, so by developing these SFABs, hopefully we can get those brigade combat teams put back together again so they can focus on what is their specified task. And the third and last reason why is, again, no one in this room can accurately predict the future, uh, least of all me. But someday, somehow, somewhere, the United States Army might have to rapidly expand. So we're increasing our end strength, you know, a little by little every year. But something could happen someday where the president or Congress says, hey, you need to rapidly expand. So the SFABs, what do they look like? They are nothing more complicated than the chain of command of an infantry brigade combat team from staff sergeant on up. So back in the day, uh, there used to be a concept called cohort units. So you had chains of command that formed, they trained together, they bonded, and they existed as a chain of command. And then basic training in AIT came a bunch of soldiers and they slapped them underneath that chain of command and very rapidly through a short series of exercises you had an effective battalion or brigade combat team. So the SFAB is a chain of command that will be in existence. So the third plus the institution of the Army gets is the potential, the capability to rapidly expand um, if needed. So we can go ahead and bring soldiers through, increase soldiers through basic training in IT, match those soldiers up to the chain of command that has been together, uh, and with a short, intense training period, you'll have an effective battalion or brigade combat team. So those are the three reasons why we have created these things called SFABs. The most important of which was the first one, which is a, a high-quality highly trained uh, advisor. Just so you know, the SFAB that is down at Fort Benning forming and training, they're in training right now at the Joint Readiness Training Center. They're doing very well. Uh, we've had about a uh, 55 or 60 percent selection rate uh, for the members. Uh, they are, are very, very uh, highly skilled and highly talented. All of the commanders and the battalion commanders, the company commanders, the brigade commander, all of the NCOs, they're in their second time duty position, which is one of the requirements we made uh, for these guys. Uh, they had uh, essentially range of regimental uh, physical fitness requirements to get into this outfit, commander's interviews, and a whole series of other qualifications. Uh, they're doing very, very well, uh, and they're the first ones, so we're taking a lot of best practices and lessons learned, and they'll be deploying next month uh, to Afghanistan, and we'll continue to garner best practices. We're standing up the second one at Fort Bragg as we speak. Uh, it'll take about a year, and they'll be prepared to deploy it this time next year. The third one, we haven't figured out exactly where to put it, but we're in the process of getting that stood up. Uh, the fourth and fifth, uh, that'll be stood up next year in 19. And then there's going to be one uh, stood up in the National Guard. So at the end of the day, uh, if everything uh, works out right and we continue uh, this process, then we'll end up with uh, five initially, and that'll allow, that gives us flexibility as an institution to rapidly expand by five if we need it. It'll hopefully get five brigade combat teams.
that are currently deployed in various parts of the world doing an advisory mission, get them put back together again so they can focus on the conventional mission, and it'll provide the combatant commander with an exceptionally highly skilled and talented advisory capability. So that's the idea behind it. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Major John Tolliver out of CGSC, Fort Belvoir. My question, sir, with regards to enhancing realistic training so our soldiers can fight and win and then serve in combat, do you see the synthetic training environment as a radical yes. advancement in that training? I do. Okay. And do you, is it going to be employed out at the National Training Center, sir? Or well, here's, see it? yeah. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about synthetic training environment. Um, for leaders, uh, NCOs and officers, uh, there's certainly a physical aspect and there's certainly friction when you conduct real operations that you can never adequately uh, replicate. And then, of course, the, the, the factor of fear uh, plays a huge role in warfare. And you can't really truly replicate fear in any kind of simulation, whether it's a training in, you know, with, you know, any kind of any, NTC, GRTC, or on computers. You're not going to replicate fear. The fear of death, the fear of dismemberment, that kind of thing. So there's some limits to all simulations. But having said that, for leaders, um, I would argue that decision making is fundamental to what leaders do in combat. And decision making under intense pressure, varied conditions, uh, and to take leaders out in the back 40 and run them through FTXs, and to take leaders uh, to NTC and JRTC uh, with full troop units and so on. That's very expensive. Um, and you won't necessarily replicate all the varied conditions that are possible out there, right? And you won't necessarily get the reps because it's so expensive. The, the technologies of virtual reality or synthetic technologies today are so advanced that we today, have, the technology exists for every leader in the Army to practice tactical and decision making under all kinds of different conditions and environments and, and terrains. Uh, and he can do it all day long. And he can do it again the next day and the next day and the next day. So there, these things exist. We can put a set of goggles on you and you can dial up, I want to go to City X. Okay, go to City X. Boom. And now you're in City X. And it looks exactly like you're actually walking down the street. And I can take those goggles and put a set of goggles on my platoon leaders and my squad leaders. And I could have them all networked together. And I can literally, everybody can be walking through the streets and tactically maneuvering through an urban area, and they can be shooting and indirect fire, calling in fire, bringing in attack helicopters. You can do all of that stuff through computers and simulation. Uh, ki kids are doing it right now, uh, in you know playing games and all that kind of stuff, right? But this is these capabilities I'm talking about are a little better than the gaming capabilities, but they're built off the same idea. So, a company commander, for example, in the future, I could envision. Every company in the Army, not out of like just NTC and JRTC, I'm talking about every company in the Army having a suite, a capability suite right there in their barracks, in their unit area. And the company commander can, they can wake up in the morning, and then they can go out and do like three hours of PT instead of what we're doing now, right? So go out and do three, three, three and a half hours of really intense PT and get in really top notch physical condition, right? And then go eat some breakfast and and then bring all your leaders and go in and get behind these machines, throw these goggles on and fight. And fight all day long, take a break for lunch, and then fight all in the afternoon. And at the end of the day, do your Article 15s and call it a day. <laughs> right? And that's a good training day. That's a good training day. Instead of, uh, you know, many things that we do today that may or may not increase the lethality of the force. We need to get rid of all the stuff that we do that is not focused on shoot, move, communicate, and destroying that enemy, stop doing that stuff, and get into how you fight. And we can take leaders and individual soldiers 
through synthetic training environments today that are highly realistic uh, if we put the money into it. Highly realistic. And we can have a very productive training day and we will increase the readiness of the Army by leaps and bounds if we pump a bunch of money into synthetic training. So if you do nothing but really a lot of PT and getting really good, you know, high quality at pro athletic levels of shape, do synthetic training environment and go out to a range every once in a while to make sure that you can really shoot the way you think you can shoot, then you'll have, a, you'll have an army that can kick some ass on a battlefield. And synthetic training environment is key to that. Uh, because, you know, where do you, you know, you go to JRTC or NTC, you got urban areas that aren't much bigger than this building, right? That, 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 that a mega city is not. So w major cities are, we don't have a replicated training, but nobody has a replicated training environment like those. But you can do it synthetically, uh, and you can be very, very real, and you can have almost out-of-body experiences wearing those goggles. So uh, I think it's great, and we're going to pump a lot of money into it, and that's underneath the soldier lethality uh, piece. One last question, sir. Yes, sir. Hi, General Milley. Courtney McBride from Inside the Army. Uh, you mentioned wanting these 10x improvements over current capabilities. Meanwhile, senior leaders are spearheading an effort to shorten the acquisition timeline with a potential futures command and the cross-functional teams. Are those two objectives not necessarily in opposition to one another? I mean, if, you're, if the technology doesn't exist yet for this 10x capability, how are you going to expedite acquisition? Um, and then separately, uh, it looks as though we're headed for another CR. Are there particular priorities in modernization or um, perhaps in munitions, for instance, where this is going to pose a serious problem for the Army? Yeah, I'll wait until we know on the I'll, second question first. I'll wait till we know whether we've got a CR or not before I answer your second one. But, you know, Jim Hickey and all the uh, great folks that work up on the Hill and the congressional staff and all the members know full well that we, the United States Army, is, as well as all the rest of uh, the other services, uh, the most fundamental important thing that we need in order to have readiness and build a future joint force uh, is sustained, predictable funding. Uh, that is really critical, uh, and continuing resolutions are not particularly helpful in that regard. Uh, but I will uh, reserve comment until after Friday on your second half. Um, on your first part, though, this is a big year for the Army because what we think uh, one of the reasons it's a big year is because we believe uh, that we need to significantly reform uh, the way the Army does research, development, science, technology, acquisition, procurement, and the whole line of modernization. We think that, um, that we have had challenges in the past in part because of our processes, uh, and our procedures, uh, and the way we have organized ourselves institutionally. It's not because we have bad people. We have excellent people in the acquisition, science, technology, procurement world. We have extraordinarily good talent. Uh, but how that talent has been getting used, and the bureaucratic procedures, and the processes, and the SOPs, and a lot of the oversight, what that has done, is in my mind, and, and, and also in Secretary Esper and Secretary McCarthy's mind and others, um, it has, it has uh, led to a whole series of challenges, failed programs, and whatnot. So what we're launching on is uh, a very ambitious uh, institutional reform, uh, the most ambitious actually in about 30, 40 years, uh, in the world of acquisition and modernization. And what you're seeing are snippets of that with these cross-functional teams and Futures Command and, and so on. We are still working through the precise structure of Futures Command, the exact procedures we want to use. Uh, we're still working our way through all the details. I would expect by March or so, uh, we will have finished that process with Secretary Esper. And then he will have made decisions at that point. Those decisions will then be announced, and then we'll move out uh, with a restructured 
institution in that particular functional area. That'll be important. That is not working at cross purposes at all with 10X or, or with uh, the idea that we want rapid, uh, significant uh, uh, capabilities. In fact, the whole purpose of restructuring, the whole purpose of all those uh, futures command, the processes, the procedures, is in fact to accelerate the process and clear out a lot of the bureaucratic inertia that prevents us from getting there. With the 10X piece, you, what you said was uh, that some of those technologies don't exist. Um, and it seems like those are in tension. In some cases, some of those technologies do exist. Uh, robotics is an example. Robotic technology exists. It's how we wrap our arms around it and bring it into the military and bring it into the army uh, that we want to get after. Um, technologies like artificial intelligence, that exists. Um, the kinetics I was talking about, uh, the bullets that I was talking about with the soldier rifle, that bullet exists in the real world. Now, there are some things that don't exist. Uh, material, for example, an extraordinarily lightweight armor material that can use in vehicles that gives you the same protective power as the current armor on an M1 tank, for example, an extremely lightweight version of that that gives you the same protective capabilities, that doesn't exist. So there are some areas that are going to take a long time in science, technology, and research development, uh, and there are others that all we, the technologies exist today, we just need to leverage it Accelerated. Synthetic training environments a perfect example. Those technologies existed five years ago, ten years ago, and we still haven't been able to do it. Uh, so what, it's a combination of both. It's not an either-or situation, and I don't think that the CFTs and or the Futures Command and the principles and attributes that underline those initiatives, I don't think they work at cross-purposes with the idea of bringing uh, 10x sort of technologies and bringing them forward. I don't think they work at cross purposes. I actually think they complement each other. Uh, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be really exciting. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a big hand for General Milley. Thanks, Chief. Yeah, thanks for that clear vision. I've known the chief long enough that I can take exception to something that he said, which is always carries with it a bit of risk. The chief mentioned that uh, what the Army needs more than anything else is sustained, predictable, adequate levels of resourcing. And I'll confess that I think that that is very, very important. It's not as important as leadership. Your leadership, Secretary McCarthy, Sergeant Major of the Army, uh, the uniformed and civilian leadership of this Army is what will keep this Army the preeminent land force on the planet. Thank you very, very much for that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, again, thanks for, for braving a, a wintry morning here in Washington, D.C. Again, a special thanks, Mr. Phillips, uh, Dan Keefe, and to the, all those from Mantec. Thanks for sponsoring a great breakfast. Have a great Army Day. Thank you.